is where this army veteran, I'm gangster, I'm telling you, I'm gangster, I can take anything. The OG. <laughs> the OG right here. Mm -hmm. This military veteran vets out veterans of comedy. Some of them are in front of the camera getting all the attention, like me. And some of us in the comedy world are behind the scenes, like the guest we have tonight named David Schwinson that's over in the other little square. Yeah, I'm over here. Yeah. Hi, Linda. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm gonna read your intro you sent me. I love reading your words and giving Oh, that's you great. I make it up every different every time. Oh, good. I might add a little. Sure, add I'm, so I go ahead and do. I I do all the time. Yeah. <laughs> He's nationally recognized comedy coach. He's the author of How to Be a Working Comic. Comedy frequently asked questions and answers, and How to Be a Working Corporate Comedian. Holy Toledo, can this guy ever be relative for us? He's a former talent coordinator for the TV show A&E's An Evening at the Improv, you guys. I'm so excited. Yeah. The Hollywood Improv, Holy Toledo, and the original improvisation in New York City. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Was also assistant to Bud Friedman. Get out of here, yeah, Bud. Get out, yes. <laughs> currently does comedy workshops at the Chicago and Cleveland Improv Comedy Clubs and internationally online workshops for comedians and humorous speakers. And I don't mean this kind of humorous. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. I ad -libbed. That's all it's right. Okay. That's what this is all about. You make it up as you go along. <laughs> he even taught us how to phonetically say his name. <laughs> yeah, and go ahead. Try it. I dare you. Try it. Sh 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 when Ten. Yeah, you got it right. That's it. Okay. Now I need to know how to spell it because I did an S-O-N on him today. His his website is www.thecomedybook.com. He's got also a YouTube channel. I went on there and I clicked the bell. I was like, you ring that bell. <laughs> you guys, he's got a podcast. What's so funny? I got to hear this. I got to hear mm -hmm. all about this guy. Let's go to him now live. Welcome. <laughs> you don't well, want thank you. That was, a, that was quite a buildup. That took up the whole show, didn't it? So I'm just saying good night. It's been nice talking <laughs> with you, and uh, we'll see you next time. I am so happy to have you here. You've done well, thank so you, much. I'm so glad you're here. Talk to me. What's Talk up? to you. Well, first of all, I want to say I watched two of your programs before I came on tonight, just to see what this is all about. And I told you this before we started. You had two guests on here, Mark Cohen and Bobby Collins. Come on. <laughs> I mean, you're starting at the top as far as I'm concerned. I, I have not talked to Mark Cohen in decades, but I love that guy. I'm still a big fan. He doesn't realize it, but I talk about him in my comedy workshops as far as about having energy on stage, that it's show business, it's a performance, the whole bit. And then Bobby Collins, yeah, we're, we're in touch. We're in touch. We get messages to each other once in a while. Matter of fact, I interviewed him for two of my books wow. and I love the guy. I mean, come on, he's a good looking guy, yeah, first of all. Probably the yeah. best looking guy comic out there, right? The thing yeah. is, he, the thing is, he knows that. <laughs> but I enjoyed both. You know, the fact you had both those guys on, it was it was fun for me to see that. He can be two four six eight. Appreciate me anytime he wants. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Now, what were we talking about? What do you want to talk about? I want to know where you grew up, how you found out you were funny, why you're a behind the scenes guy instead of like a a hog like the rest of us. Well, I am kind of a hog like the rest of you. I do I do about 30, 40 gigs a year, but I do things, I'll talk about that later. I do it on different things. I'm a corporate speaker and I've written a couple books on pop culture. So I'm always talking in front of schools and libraries and lifelong learners and all that. So I get my stage time in. Okay. So I, that's, that's my outlet. But yeah, I, I'm more of a, I've been, I'm known as a behind the scenes guy is what it is. And uh, I grew up, uh, and right now I'm, I'm in Cleveland. Like I said, I go between Cleveland and Chicago with the improv comedy clubs. For a while, I was also manager of the Cleveland Improv. I did that for a while. Wow. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been uh, with both those clubs. And 
you know, I've done the Tampa Improv for my works. I've been pretty much affiliated with, with the Improv for a long time. And as far as I'm concerned, it's number one club in the world. You can't argue with me about that. It's what it is. Um, I grew up outside of Cleveland. And uh, when I graduated college with my business degree, I thought, well, what kind of business do I want to be in? I want to be in show business. <laughs> and there's no, <laughs> there was no show business out here at that time. So I packed up my car and I moved to New York City. I didn't know anybody. I just went and uh, found my way around. And nice. um, yeah, so I did a lot of things before I got involved in the comedy business. And uh, I used to play music a lot in the village. Uh, played a couple bands, uh, did some soap operas, did that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, then I decided, well, I want to try stand-up comedy. I had a good friend that was doing it. I said, that's a lot of fun. Let me kind of hang around. I took a comedy workshop in New York City. Not as good as mine. <laughs> I was waiting for that laugh there. <laughs> But we, we wrote three minutes of comedy and I got on stage at a comedy club in New York City uh, and I had probably one laugh. <laughs> I thought, wow, <laughs> well, this is great. I could be a star doing this. <laughs> and uh, so I started hitting all the open mics in New York City and uh, I realized, and I was trying to jump ahead too fast again. That's what my workshops are about. Tell people there, there's no such thing as an overnight success, by the way. I've never met one. I don't believe they exist. I mean, there are people who've gotten on stage because mommy and daddy have money or they've done something, but they can't back it up because they don't have the experience. It's all about stage time and writing and write. Comedians, I, I give them so much respect because it's not, they make it look easy. Good ones make it look easy, but it's not. No, it takes okay. a lot of work. Well, I learned that myself. And uh, when I was starting to do the open mics in New York City, I probably did it for about a month or two with a, wow, I'm really good. <laughs> I'm going to try out for the improv or someplace. <laughs> and uh, they, they always had lottery systems. The comics know what I'm talking about. You stand in a long line once a month, you go in and you try to pull a number out of a champagne bucket or out of a hat. If you get a number, you get to audition for three minutes that night. If not, mm, we'll see you next month. I could never, ever, ever pull a number, which is probably the best thing that could have happened to me. And so uh, I thought, well, how am I going to get stage time? I got to get stage time. And so I thought, well, I'm going to start my own comedy club. And I did. And I'll throw a shout out to my good friend, Chris Murphy, because he is somebody who does comedy workshops in New York City. Everybody, he's the, probably the number one MC in New York City. Anybody who's in the business in New York knows who this guy is. Uh, one of my best friend. So we decided, the two of us, let's just start a comedy club. So we did in Gramercy Park in New York, 20th Street and 3rd Avenue. Uh, what year was this? I'm not going to say. Oh, I, I can guess. <laughs> it was in the 1980s. It was in the okay. 80s. Um, so uh, we, it was a bar restaurant. It was called the Honey Tree. And actually, I was the manager of the place at the time. So I knew we could rev up some more business. We did comedy shows there on Friday, Saturday night, if we did this right. So we renamed it the Funny Tree. And the great thing about comedy is all we had to do, we built a little stage. at had a four foot by four foot stage. I had a microphone and a stand, a little amplifier from my music days playing down the village. We set that up. We went over to Woolworths, and bought a sun lamp, and we hung it up from the ceiling. So that was our spotlight. And the great <laughs> thing is all you have to do is put up a stage and a microphone and a spotlight and comedians show up. <laughs> They're there. And so uh, we started doing these shows. And I'm going to say they were very successful. I mean, the place only held maybe about seating for about 50 people, uh, but we packed it. We packed it and then there would be, there was a bar area where the people who couldn't get into the showroom uh, would sit at the bar. So we set up a video camera so we could show the, the comics on the TV over the bar. So instead of watching the Yankees or the Mets or something, we're showing comics that were in the back room. And um, we did this for about six months and I got to be the MC for every show. And now my friend Chris got a job at the New York Improv up on 44th Street. He was, he was in the coat room at the time. It was during the winter. So he would call. He had the cordless phone. He's sitting in the coat room. He would call me when certain comics got off. He says, hey, so-and-so just got off. Should I send him down there? I said, yeah, send him down. So I got to meet some of the comics I, got, I, I later worked with who were pretty well known. And I'll throw Dave Attell into that group and Mark Marin and, and Brett Butler. And uh, I remember the weigh-ins, Sean and Marlon coming down. And this is a small club and we couldn't pay anyone. It was pretty much an open mic, but they were getting a real audience. You know how tough that is in an open mic. Yes. You, know, you get a room full of other comics sitting there working on their acts. They're not paying attention to you. They're getting ready to go on stage. This was a real audience and people really wanted to play our clubs. And it was great for me because all of a sudden the other 
open mic producers in town that weren't giving me stage time. All of a sudden they're showing up. Hey, Dave, I could put you on Monday night if you could put me on tonight. And I'm like, all right, you know. Sometimes cool. I remember, sometimes if they were real, had been real nasty to me, I'm like, now you look at my crowd on a Saturday night. I got 60 people in here. You get two people on a Monday. I think I'll just stay here. It's <laughs> <laughs> awful to say that. To say that. I, I really didn't, wasn't like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, after about, I would say about six months of doing this, uh, I went up to the New York Improv and Chris introduced me to Silver Saunders, who ran the Improv, Silver. And everyone in New York knows who Silver is. And uh, I said, I was, and, and the deal was, you know, at the <laughs> improv and, and a lot of these comedy clubs, you want to get your foot in the door. How can you get your foot in the door? Sometimes you become a, a doorman, door guy, or you work in a coat room, or you answer phones, or you're a bartender, you're a server, whatever. I mean, sometimes, you know, a lot of yes. comics kind of get in that way. So yes. I just want to get my foot in the door. So uh, she needed a Sunday night bartender. And she asked if I could tend bar. And I said, sure, because I've managed a restaurant for a long time and I've tended bar a lot. I said, yeah. So she said, okay. So she hired me as a Sunday night bartender. So I went to the improv and I'm standing, and it was just comics at the bar because all the audience people, they sit in the showroom and they're dropping the money in there. I'm sitting at a bar bartending for a bunch of comics who are going to sit there all night. They got no money. They're hoping they can drink three drinks, get the fourth one free was the deal. <laughs> yes. I'm like, I'm like, well, financially this is not going to work out for me but i've got a foot in the door anyway at the end of my <laughs> at the end of my sunday night shift i was counting the money now i told you earlier i mean i, I got i got a degree in business my mm -hmm. college degree mm -hmm. and so i don't think the bartenders previous to me maybe they had a hard time counting money i'm not sure how it worked <laughs> anyway silver's face lit up because i counted it exactly right to the penny she goes wow i said yeah and the assistant manager was leaving I remember he was going back to, I think he was from Australia or something. Time. She said, would you like to be the assistant manager? I said, sure. So wow. I went back the next night, Monday night, and I was the assistant manager being trained. I worked Monday, Tuesdays, got to manage the club. And then uh, the manager at the time, I'm not going to mention his name, but he is also a good guy. I love this guy. We're friends. But there was an argument and Silver fired him. It was about two weeks later. She turned around to me. She says, you're the manager. And the, <laughs> the first thing I did was pass myself for the audition. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first thing i did but i gotta tell you i and i'm not gonna say i was any good the comics remember me from back then i was more involved with running the shows i didn't take the time it took. <laughs> i was at the new york improv five nights a week I wasn't <laughs> writing i was I'd, I'd get up on the stage once a week and i remember i was just like i horrible i I, mean, I could i gave myself a seven minute set one time i'm like oh god i'm never gonna do that again <laughs> And, 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 the, and the guy who went on like two backs after me was like Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing? But I loved what I was doing there because I was putting together the shows with Silver and she was very good at that, very helpful. She, tra she taught me so much. And um, then I remember she, she kind of moved to Long Island. She got a house or something. So she was going to take off. So I was really in charge of the club. And the comics were telling me that that didn't happen with the other managers, that there was always someone there to check in. So I would see her on Wednesdays she would manage Monday, Tuesday. I would come in Wednesday. We'd kind of change notes. She would leave to catch the train to Long Island. And I would run the club from Wednesday through Sunday, I guess. And, um, but I would get calls from, um, you know, the, the David Letterman show, the Tonight Show, when Jim McCauley would come out from LA looking for acts. Uh, Comedy Central, HBO, MTV, Showtime. I'd go on and on. They would call looking for comics. And the improv was the number one club. I mean, they all came to the improv when they were scouting. So I got to start help them put together showcases. And for the comics who, you know, I mean, I, I remember, I mean, like the Today Show called me up during an election year. And he said, we're looking for political comics. Do you have any political? I said, yeah, I know some political comics. Can you put together a showcase for us? Because we want to put one on the air. So I, I knew about 10 comics that did political material. And I called them all up, say, hey, come in on a Wednesday night, just do three minutes. The, Tonight Show, the Today Show is going to be here and they're going to pick someone out for the show. I really like that. Yes, I really it gives did. me the chills that you got to do that. Yeah, and you know, and and really for my own stage time, for my own whatever, I I did a music act. The New York <laughs> Improv was famous for having a musical act, and uh, I had my guitar. I'm not gonna say I was any good at that either, but <laughs> I told Silver one time. I said, I said, yeah, I need a raise. <laughs> well, I said, how about I give myself two music sets a week that pay, they didn't pay it, it was gas money, taxi money, whatever. 
And so we worked out that deal. So I got to do Wednesday nights and I got to do one of the weekend shows, a Friday or a Saturday night. Wow. And, uh, and I loved it. I just loved it. I loved it. And I'll shout out to my friend, Mike Sergio, who was the main musical act. We had what we called the music wars going on. We were always making fun of each other. He's the guy that parachuted in the Shea Stadium during the World Series wow. in 1986. So, but anyway, wow. so sometimes I would always keep my guitar behind the bar. If he was up there playing his music set, we had the band, Bob Cross and, and Tom Pyle, piano player, bass player up there. It was good. They were really good. And every once in a while, I would grab my guitar from behind the bar. I'd just come running down the aisle because we have a full sold out show, all the audience there. And he would see me on stage and go, No, Dave, no, no, no. And I'd jump up on stage with my guitar and I'm just faking. <laughs> I didn't know his chords. I'm just faking. <laughs> I, I just, I loved it. I loved it. And you know, it was performing. It was fun. And um, basically, I just decided it was getting too cold in the winter times for me. I'd been in New York City for like 13 years and I was tired of being cold. So I moved out to Los Angeles. And it took a while, but I finally um, met, uh, I'd met Bud Friedman in, at the New York club before, but I heard he was looking for an assistant. And a friend of mine called me, said, you know, Bud's looking for an assistant. You should call up over there. So I called up and met with him. Actually, when I had my first meeting with him, I remember it was the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, it was him and Jay Leno and me. So I was being interviewed by Bud and Jay. <laughs> and they're like, who do you think is funny? I said, so I mentioned somebody, I'm not going to say, I don't remember who, someone from New York, they may not have heard of me. Oh yeah, he's real funny. They kind of looked at each other like I was nuts. I'm like, oh God, I blew that one. Uh, <laughs> anyway, then I met Bud's wife, Alex, the next day. And they, two of them took me out to lunch and, and I, I, I guess we just hit it off because he hired me and so I was his assistant. And what was that, that by the like time, working huh? for him? What was oh, that wonderful. Like? Wonder, it was a dream job. Dream job. I don't know what else to tell you. It was just, I mean, come on, it's the Hollywood improv. So great. And I'm Bud's assistant, you know, the talent coordinator is what they called me. And, you know, got to work every comic you can think of, Jeez. you know, we had called in for spots. And I had to tell them if they had a spot or not that week and when it was and what night, and what time and when to be there and all that stuff. And yeah, um, yeah. so, I mean, just, yeah. You had quite job. the life. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And plus with the Hollywood Improv, I got to start doing showcases for the, there were the movie studios, you know, Paramount, and Disney, and all the TV networks were doing auditions. So they would call to say, we're looking for a 20 something year old skinny guy. And do you have any of those? Yeah, I got a bunch of them. You know, come on in, we'll give everyone mm -hmm. three minutes. And then, then I got to take over evening at the Improv, the TV show. How was and, that? Again, it was just a lot of fun. I mean, come on. My I job know. was to sit there and have people make me laugh. And if they made me laugh, I got to put them on television. So that's, I mean, I would have my auditions on Monday nights. I could see 10 comics do three minutes each in half an hour. Boom, let's go. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, some of them weren't ready. And I was, I, I always prided myself on being very nice. I'm not gonna hurt anyone's feelings or take away anyone's dreams or anything, but you know, you're not right yet. Maybe try again in six months, you know, get some more stage time, more stage time. Then other ones, it was just a lot of fun to, to see them that nobody had found these people yet and exactly. to, to do something for them. Wow. I mean, I've always kind of prided myself too on helping younger comedians. I mean, the ones who kind of need a break, who deserve a break. So, and that's kind of like, and, and then I left there eventually for family reasons. The only reason I came back, I kind of thought I'd go back to LA. That's what happens. Then you get married and you have a couple of kids and you're out here. And so we had a Cleveland improv. So really within the first year after I came back, I started doing comedy workshops. And uh, that was interesting how it happened because when I came back here, I'd been gone for so long. I didn't know anybody anymore. Didn't know, even before I met my wife. Um, so there were, you know, two, there were two major comedy clubs in Cleveland, Hilarities and The Improv. And oh, by this time I'd started writing for a newspaper. I was doing entertainment columns every week for music yeah. and of course comedy. Mm -hmm. So I was doing interviews and reviews. I got all the show tickets. It was all great, wow. you know? And, um, but I would go to the clubs and hang out with the headliners because they were the only ones I knew. I knew these guys. So I would sit backstage and I'd be, you know, I could talk to, you know, Drew Carey or Jeff Foxworthy or Bobby Collins, uh, whoever else was around. And the local comics were pointing to me and asking them, who's that guy? Why are you talking? Why are they talking to him? Who's that guy? Well, that's Dave Schwentz and he used to book evening at the improv. He used to be Bud's assistant. So they'd come over to me and start asking me questions. They say like, how do I get an agent? You know, how do I get a manager? How do I, you know, uh, what's, what's, uh, what should I put in my PR package? You know, what, what, how long should my videotape be? That kind of stuff. And so I just thought 
I'll do a one time only. I'll do a comedy works. I knew they did these in New York and I knew I'd, been, I'd spoken at some in LA. I was like a guest speaker. So I knew that. So I thought, well, let me do one of these in Cleveland for the local comics. And I'm going to do it once. That's it. Just yes. do it once. So I kind of put the word out, said, you know, whoever wants to do this, you know, it's what it's going to cost because it cost me to, you know, I had to pay the clubs and stuff to get the place. Yeah. Anyway, um, I did it once and, you know, that's 20 years ago now. <laughs> I keep doing them. I mean, I just like, I don't know. And before this whole big um, pandemic hit, I mean, I had one scheduled for Cleveland. It was sold out with a waiting list. And um, we came right down to the day before we were supposed to start. Um, I got the call from, I was in touch with the club. And then Friday, my friend who manages the club now has my old job at the Cleveland Improv. I got it for him. So Craig, if you're watching this, you know, I put in the word for you. Uh, he called me up. He said, it's Armageddon. We're closing down. It never happens, you know? And, oh my gosh. Uh, that's it. Pandemic. So, yeah. So I've taken my workshops online now. And, um, and you know, the thing is, too, I want to say this. I mean, my workshops, I know I'm doing all the talking, Linda. I'm so sorry. I haven't given you a Are chance. you kidding me? I'm enjoying this and you're so hard to look at. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just want to say that. Hey. If Bobby Collins is watching, he's got to be jealous now. Um, Sinbad you know, my, who? <laughs> took my mother to see Sinbad years ago, too. Uh, very funny. And uh, yeah. anyway, anyway, uh, my workshops, what I do, because um, I am a behind the scenes guy. And, you know, I mean, I've got my book right here. I brought it out. I and mean, it's called How to Be a Working Comic. All right. It's a business book. I consider my books to be business books. So I don't believe in any formula, how to write a joke. No, they're just a clone, whoever's teaching that. We used to have a couple guys in New York, some of the older guys. Here's how you write a joke. <laughs> and a tell of this to guys like, you know, Ray Romano, it would be sitting there and some of these great storytellers. And we're like, okay, all right, sure. Um, I, I talk a lot about the business side of it. I, I talk about what they were looking for, say when I booked the evening at the improv or even with the improv clubs you know, what they'd be looking, and even still, I mean, I said, I, I used to manage the, I'm still in touch. I'm still going to the improv clubs all the time. Here's what they're looking for. Okay. Here's if you want to get in, or you want to get in something, you know, up on someone doing a contest, or you want to break into a club, or how do you contact the agent? I talk about all this stuff, but yes, I also, we write five minute comedy sets. Everybody comes up with a five. It doesn't sound like the long time, but I told them, Hey, in New York and LA, three minutes. All right. You want to audition for America's Got Talent? I know I coach people to do that. 90 seconds. 90 seconds. How can I show myself in 90 seconds? We're getting a different job or figure out you're just not going to play there, you know, but this is what <laughs> we're looking for. And, um, and I share advice that I've gotten from the best, I mean, the writing advice I share is from George Carlin. Come on. And then Drew Carey has given me, people have given me writing advice my whole career. This is how they write or I watch them. I would watch them write at the New York Improv. I'd watch them at the Westway Diner around the corner, what they're doing. And who's helping who and what how they're doing this and so I, I all i do is just share a thing i don't make up this stuff i'm telling you what george carlin told me okay wow. you can use it if you want or you can use your own way or here's what i saw larry david doing or someone like that at the improv bar and um that's it and then i a lot of behind the scenes stuff i like to share i'm a big name dropper but i do it in a way that shows either they're doing something wrong that I learned this from someone else. So trying to save you a few months on a learning curve, or this is what they told me they did. So why don't you try this? You know, and, uh, and I love to talk about the business side of it, you know, the different markets. I mean, it's not just comedy clubs. I always say that's the low rung on the ladder. Really? Uh, it's great. Yes. Comedy clubs. I mean, they're great for getting your name out there and your fan base and all that stuff. However, <laughs> I mean, when, <laughs> when I, when I moved back, to the Midwest of Cleveland, um, I started working in the college market. I was a college agent for NACA, National Association for Campus Activities. I did that about seven, eight years. Had my own company and I booked, you know, corporate shows, college shows. And so I tell them, I said, you know, that those are big money markets. Yes. But you've got to be very good. You got to have experience. You got to write for those markets, that kind of stuff. But you know, a lot of times they'll say to me, oh, so-and-so canceled the improv this week or hilarities or the funny bone or zanies, whatever clubs. Say, oh, they canceled. I hope they're not sick. Yeah, I don't think they're sick. I think they picked up a corporate gig that's going to pay them in one hour what they're going to make the entire weekend at the club. And you'll see yeah. them back on a schedule if they're good enough. 
in a few weeks. I have seen people, I was with Washington Mutual in the corporate office in Seattle before they went belly up. I had no hand in that, honestly. And, I believe you. <laughs> and uh, we had a guy come in, Bob Moad. He was funny and a, a corporate speaker. He got $50,000 mm -hmm. for like an hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like holy Toledo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to talk money, but I've booked some comics for some really big money. Yeah. And I get my little percentage, which is kind of nice. Oh, and like I said, good. I do, you know, with, even with myself now, I mean, I do have this, I, I like to be on stage. I like to, you know, work the crowd and stuff. And, and I, but I do it more as corporate training, you know, uh, based on my comedy workshops mm -hmm. and my books and things like that. So it is like, you know, I do icebreakers, networking, cool. uh, team building. And I give them, you know, I exercises kind of what we do in my comedy workshop. It's kind of like some improv stuff and, but I like to walk around and talk to people. So it's sort of like jaywalking. You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, but for me, it's, it's been working in that um, atmosphere. And, uh, and I've written two books about pop culture, actually tell on the me, Beatles. Tell me about your books. Uh, with the comedy books first? Sure. Or, I mean, the comedy books, I mean, started out, uh, my first book is called How to Be a Working Comic. Uh -huh. And um, this is the new revised edition okay the, the first one that came out had my picture on the front cover <laughs> i got a lot of <laughs> flack from that for the comics um <laughs> but it was published by bpi communications in new york so my liter i have a literary agent and a publisher in new york and they came out with it and I, it did quite well I, I i was told it went into five printings and it was around the wow. world all that stuff but i was very fortunate like you can even see on this i mean the ford was written by ray romano wow he remembers doing that uh but he, <laughs> bobby collins is in this book um, Drew Carey, Jeff Foxworthy, uh, Dom Irrera, a good friend who I just saw uh, before all this lockdown happened. I saw him in Florida, went to see one of his shows. Uh, but what I did was when I started working, doing my workshops for the improvs, and this was in Cleveland, um, comics, that mean the potential aspiring comedians would ask me questions. Again, like, what does an agent do? Well, I kind of knew what an agent did. But I said, well, let me, you know, I'll get back with you on this next week. So I'd have their questions and I'd call up my friend who was an agent. What do you do exactly? <laughs> so you tell me. And I type it out and whatever, run it off. And I come in next week and I said, give him a handout. Here's what an agent does. And then the next week, all right, here's what a manager does. All right, next week, here's how to make a promo package. And I kept doing it. It got to the point where my comedy workshops, I was giving a handout of 125 pages, okay, to each person. I mean, it was 120. I was at copy machines and punching things together because I was starting a workshop the next day and I always have like 10 people. I, I always limit it to 10 people. It's really- uh, That's a, a good number. Yeah, I don't believe in this cattle call or as many people as you can get. I like to work with people. Everyone is an individual in this business. That's what sets you apart. Yeah. You gotta be unique and an individual. And that's what I, so 10 people is the most I would take. And um, so I had a 125 page handout for each person. And I realized you know, and I was talking to some important people. I mean, I had some really nice interviews with people. Carrot Top, the Smothers Brothers, you know. And I wow. thought, you know, I, I, I think I have a book here. So I um, bought, well, I, the, I started sending to publishers, like anyone else that tries to get a book published, you get nothing but rejection shit slips back. So I thought, well, you know, you know, if I got a literary agent, so I got a book on literary agents, and I started at A, <laughs> <don't look laughs> but I got the B, and when I got the B, I got an agent. She said, this is good. Wow. And so she had me rewrite it probably about five times. <laughs> and she started shopping it around to agents. And she got an agent in New York. Like I said, it was BPI Communications. Uh, they did, I think they did Billboard and Backstage and some of these big show business things. Mm -hmm. And they had me rewrite it like five times. And I was so fed up with it. <laughs> and then it was really exciting when it came out. I mean, I was a published author. Wow. And um, it did very well. And then people started me sending me more questions about the comedy industry and so i started keeping track of those and i started calling up comics who i'd worked with i consider to be friends and very helpful and uh I, that wound up being my second book which is this one comedy faqs and answers cool how the stand-up biz really works so these were all questions that were emailed to me from around the world and um you know, I answered them as best I could, but I also wanted real professionals. 
So for instance, again, I, mean, I mentioned him earlier, we started talking tonight, but George Carlin. Okay, so someone sent me a question, is it better to work clean or dirty as a comedian? What's better, clean or dirty? I thought, well, who better to ask than George Carlin? So I called him, I had his number, real nice. And uh, he said, I remember we, he was driving or something. He says, well, call me, call me tomorrow. Like at such and such a time, I'll be in my office. So I called him at that time. He picked up the phone. He's right there. And so I said, all right, better to work clean or dirty. So his answer is in the book. Then he started talking to me about writing comedy, how he writes comedy. And he's got his technique was just amazing. So that is in this book, nice. How to Be a Working Corporate Comedian. Oh. All right. The George Carlin technique is in that book. And um I write more than I watch television. <laughs> <laughs> so you have three books or more? I, I've got more books. Um, I've got, uh, matter of fact, I just now am waiting for my sixth book. Wow. To come. I'm waiting for a proof copy to have proofread. It's um, when, I, when I first came back here to Ohio and I really, for Cleveland, I, I really started writing. So I, I started writing entertainment columns for a local newspaper here. And it was mm -hmm. comedy, it was music. Mm -hmm. And yeah, some really cool musicians. I think I got to hang out with Willie Nelson on his tour bus. I got to go backstage, hang out with the Monkees. I had a private concert by the Monkees. What? Uh, Britney Spears, you know, oh. the Everly Brothers. I mean, I'm like, this is all great. But <laughs> I, I also wanted to be a humorist. I mean, I think I'm funny. No one else does, but I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and uh, I started writing a humor column called um, Something to Laugh About. And it was every Sunday. I got about five or six newspapers. I won an award in Ohio, Newspaper Association, best original column. Wow. And uh, during this lockdown we've had, mm -hmm. we uh, had moved, we lived in Chicago for a while, but I moved back here, family reasons again. But anyway, we we're cleaning out our storage center, not quite a year, it was last fall in Chicago. And I pulled out this great big notebook, I mean like this thick, because mm -hmm. with all my humor columns, I'd cut out of the newspaper and I kept them in notebooks. So they're all in a storage unit in Chicago. <laughs> so while we've been locked down, I sit down at night and they're all 800 words each. Uh, I went through and picked out the ones that I thought were funny and the ones I thought were maybe like dated that I can't use anymore. I kind of just put those away somewhere. So I wound up with 144 columns that I thought were funny. <laughs> <laughs> so it, that's a new book and it's called wow. Something to Laugh About. Um, and cool. hopefully it's going to be out within the month. I mean, the ebook is finished. It's, it's done, but I just need to make corrections. I need to go through one more proofreading. Where It'll do nice. people buy? I want to buy your books. Where do I buy your books at? Well, I used to say they were in all the bookstores, but I can't say that anymore because there aren't any more bookstores. <laughs> so um, I always steer everyone to Amazon, you know, for paperback and Kindle. But I know they're on iBooks and Apple. And uh, I don't know, Barnes and Noble. I mean, I still get stuff, notices from them. So I mean, if you Google whatever, it comes up, the books. And then my so, website, which you gave earlier, is you know the t h e comedy and I've got them on there. Okay. But, um, really, like the Amazon is, I mean, it's around the world. I mean, I you know I, I see them in all England and France and Australia, New Zealand, whatever. They're there. But yeah, you asked how many other books. So I, that's I, I've told you about four. I've written two other books, and a lot of people, my comedy friends, don't know this. And uh, <laughs> my my. People that would buy the two books I'm going to show you now, they don't know about me that you and I are talking about. I have two different personas. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've had to separate them because it got people too confused. So I'm the comedy coach. I wrote the comedy books, you know, that kind of stuff. Now, the other part of me is an author. I always call it a pop culture author, but I've written two books on the Beatles. What? So the first one was called The Beatles in Cleveland. Wow. I'm out here in Cleveland, so I got to interview everyone and research the book, and uh, it, it turned out to do pretty well also. <laughs> and I, I started bet. going to, I got invited to Beatle festivals, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Louisville, different places, and I started doing programs. And my follow-up book is about the most famous concert they ever did, which is called The Beatles at Shea Stadium. Wow. Okay. So uh, the story behind their greatest concert. And it's also about the making of the television special they did. This is all back in the 60s. Yes. And uh, I'm so lucky I did these before we lost a lot of these people because my wife tells me everybody I interviewed has kind of died. And she says, uh, it's a good thing. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't interview any more people. <laughs> Bad luck. But I put together, I mean, I've been a fan, you know, and. That is so cool. You know, I thought, well, I'll write these books. And it really, uh, 
anyway, so that keeps me on stage a lot because I do schools when they get like history, when they get into the 60s or music classes, um, lifelong learners, senior centers, the baby boomers, you know, yes. and um, yeah, I want, I want to teach in classes on this on video conferences, but like in person and I show rare concert films. That's the whole thing. I always say people don't come out to see me. They come out to see these rare concert films I have of the Beatles that no one else has seen. So anyway, so I've written six books. That is so yeah. cool. I know a lot of the Beatle fan people like Helene Witt and Kathy Kelleher, Saver down in, I, yeah, I know. And that's a, that's a cool group of people, you know? Yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of good friends. I have a separate Facebook page. I have a separate uh, Twitter account. I have a separate LinkedIn that's all with the rock and roll. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a big like Rolling Stones, Aerosmith. And I love, you know, classic, classic rocker is what I call myself. I have a classic yeah. rocker blog. Wow. Okay? Which is completely separate than the comedy stuff I'm doing. But um, yeah, and, and, and what I've been doing also during, I had a lot of live gigs, September, you know, from spring through summer. Everything's been canceled. Everything's been postponed up until right now. I still have one on September 22nd is my next one. Um, but because I've been teaching uh, schools, classes, and video conferences for years. I've been using Zoom, I don't know, years and years. And uh, I said, well, let me just do my programs for the Beatles fans. So I set it all up with the concert posters. I got my Beatles t-shirt on. I'm like, all right, we're going to go back to the 1960s. I'm going to talk to you about, and I'm having a blast, even though I can't see the audience because they're mainly webinars, but I'm getting questions through the bottom, like we're doing Zoom right now. And I get hands up and all this stuff. And, and um, I do them for free. And I say, if you yeah. think it's worth something, it's like a street musician. I'm going to pass a hat. I want to throw something in. That's good. You know, help me pay for the webinar license and the pro account and all that stuff. But uh, yeah. yeah, I do. I do completely different programs. One is on the Beatles at Shea Stadium. The other is on the Beatles in Cleveland. And I show wow. the videotapes and everything too on, online. So that I'm is so cool. I want. I want all your books. I'm not making any money doing this. I'm buying people's. <laughs> merchandise that's what i'm doing <laughs> <laughs> i'm a fan of everybody that has come before me in comedy are you kidding me mm -hmm. my hat's off to you for serving up all you've served up <laughs> well <laughs> hey well, I, I felt like talking so i don't know yes. Maybe i said too I much I was, you know, like I've only been doing comedy six years and I went around the streets of Philly when I lived there. I had a roommate in Philly, you might know Paul Lyons. He was my roommate. Oh my God, I love Paul Lyons. We Don't played on the Rob softball team. Uh, I follow him on Facebook. He's, he's a great That's roommate because he's, he's always gone on a cruise ship. So he's a great oh, roommate. Oh. <laughs> and oh yeah, and so um, I've had some great roommates along the time, you know, that I've been doing comedy. So when I was there, he was like, uh, he came to a graduation show at Vince Valentine's collective comedy collective thing that I did, went on, you know, and, and you know, I, I have a little bit of a brain injury and a big personality. So audiences are kind of like divided, you know, I get it. And so he, I got done and Paul says, have you ever thought about being authentic? And I'm like, well, what the hell is that? So I went, had to go study what authentic was Mm -hmm. And then I went around the streets of Philly and asked people, when you look at me, what do you see? Like, what do you expect of me? Just non-verbally, you know, what do you want me to say? What don't, I'm older, talking to young, young people, asking them, what do they not want an old person on stage? I learned so much from asking questions of people. Mm -hmm. And it totally well, revamped my con gave me a persona. I didn't have one before I went out and asked people, what do you like? I didn't know who I was on stage. Are you kidding me? I'm just glad I'm on stage. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> no, it's called learning your comedy voice. I learned yes. that, that phrase from Bud Friedman, actually out in LA, what's your comedy voice. And it takes yeah. a comic a long time to figure that out. Yes, a long so, time. Who you are on stage. You know what else is something that I don't know if you've studied it or have it in your books, but I get kind of tired. I rip on this subject a little bit as a sarcastic person. Like I get so sick and tired of people telling me you need to learn how to read the room. It's like become one of my jokes, like read mm -hmm. the room, you know, like what am I supposed to? Oh, you know, just read the room and nobody can break it down for you how to read the room. 
but you better do it right. You know, it's mm -hmm. and even going to mics is kind of to me like a joke, you know, get up there and get stage time. And it's like you're bowling with blindfolds on thing, you know, and so um, a lot of the tra time you're on stage learning comedy, you're like, what am I learning? It, it can you're supposed to enjoy it. But what are you enjoying? You don't even know what you're enjoying. Anyway, back to you. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I always call it know your audience. Yeah. And so many of the newer comedians, it takes experience. It really does. Again, I don't know. I remember one time, the only guy I ever accused of being an overnight success was uh, Dave Chappelle. Because uh, I met him <laughs> when he was very, very young. Put him on evening at the improv. Matter of fact, I've got another story where I almost killed him one night by accident. <laughs> but uh, that's another story. Anyway, he was <laughs> with the Chappelle show. And he was touring. He had this big bus, tour bus. And his face was his, on the side of the bus. It was his picture. It's as big as a billboard of this bus. <laughs> and he was, and the, the joke is with Dave Chappelle, when I said I almost killed him, he, he was in my car. I was getting him to a gig too fast. And he had his hands on the dashboard. He's going, oh my, and his friend, another Dave, 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 and Dave I'm driving. He's in the passenger seat. Another Dave's in the backseat. <laughs> they were supposed to be at the, actually, they were supposed to be at the Santa Monica Improv. I, I, I was sitting at the Melrose Club, the Hollywood Club, and Dave Chappelle walks in. He comes over to me and says, hello. I said, what are you doing here? He says, you gave me a spot. I said, I gave you a spot in Santa Monica. I didn't give you a spot here. You're on in Santa Monica in like in half an hour. He goes, well, I'm from New York. I don't know how to drive or something like that. I don't have a car. I said, oh, God. I said all right, get, get my car. So we ran out. I had this Vega. No, not Vega. I had a, a Mustang convertible, just a <laughs> lemon of a car. I used to break down all the time. Anyway, I threw him and he grabbed his pal Dave, Dave Edwards, who's his name. Uh, grabbed him, put him in the back seat. Dave Chappelle sat next to me. I'm driving, doing about 90 miles an hour, trying to get to the Santa Monica Club. Because number one, it looks he was just kind of new there, out there. He was from New York, uh, whatever. I wanted to get him there. I couldn't miss the spot. It would look bad. Yeah. Pulled up in front of, and, and the whole time we're driving out there, and whatever freeway it was, he had his hands on the dashboard. He might have had his foot up. He goes, "Oh my God, I can see it now. Four Daves, the three Daves die in fiery car accident." And I'm going, <laughs> "Shut up, Go, shut up!" Like this, I'm driving. And as we get to the Santa Monica Improv and I pull up in front of the place, hit the brakes. I said, get out. <laughs> <laughs> and he and this other Dave jump out there, run the club and he made the spot. So years later, he's got the Chappelle show or whatever. And so he was performing in Cleveland at the Improv. And um, so I went out there and his bus was parked in the parking lot of the Improv. So I went over and I banged on the bus door. I went, boom, 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 like this. And I'm standing there. <laughs> I see this curtain open up. And Chappelle looks out and he goes, hey, three Daves die in fiery car accident. <laughs> <laughs> he opened the door so I got in the bus so I'm sitting there we're talking and I said I accused I said you know you're an overnight you're the only one I ever know it was an overnight success you were like 18 years old when I met you okay and I put you on evening at the improv was, he goes no no he corrected me right away he said he was 14 years old when he started his mother used to take him to all the open mics in around Washington DC because he was too young to get into these bars on his own so she would take him in and he would do the open mics so he had four five six years of experience before I even met him and he wow. was good. So there's no such thing as an overnight success. No. In the business. Tell me a funny story that happened in a club. I just told you. Another one. Inside a club when the club is full, maybe a really funny heckler or something. There's no such thing as a funny heckler. It's only what the comedians do to make them funny. Hecklers are annoying. They think, and most <laughs> of them come up and they tell you, I was just trying to help. I was trying to help you out. I was part of the show. I was trying to help you out. Yeah. You we didn't help anyone out. Okay, maybe the comic, if they're good at this, you know, can recover. Otherwise, I found them annoying. And the best thing about when I was at the New York Improv, I had an ex-cop and another <laughs> big bouncer with me. So some of them would yell during the show. I would have to say, please be quiet kind of stuff. And then you know, next time, I would take these two big guys with me. I'm going to have, please be quiet. Yeah, what are you going to do about it? I said, I'm not going to do nothing. I'd step back and these two big guys would grab them and take them out in the street. Boom, they're gone. <laughs> Uh, I don't put up with that, that nonsense, but there are comics and I'll tell you like Bobby Slayton was one, Brett mm -hmm. Butler was another, I can't think, you know, some of the others who have told me before they went on stage, if anyone heckles, don't stop them. Lisa Lampanelli was another one. Don't stop them. If they heckle, that's part of what I do. I'll just tear their heads off. I'll rip them apart. So, wow. okay, go for it. But that's what they do. And there's other comics who I've seen will just, they'll stop. Say, somebody get this person out of here. It's disrupting this show. So there we no, go. No, that's funny, but there's a story for you. I like it. I'm going to be buying your books. I'm going on to your website tonight. Okay. Well, you get them faster through Amazon than you will in front from me, I think. 
Okay, I'll go Amazon. Yeah, I'm just just telling you that sometimes That's they want cool. a signed book or something, but uh, I mm. I don't even know how many I have around. This might be my only copy. <laughs> Thank you so much for being so courteous to come on here tonight and spend time sharing your comedy life. And you're behind the scenes in some regards, but you're out in the front in the corporate com comedy environment, right? I try. And with the Beatles fans, I'm on stage all the time. So they they get to see me at least every other week, even I online. <laughs> wow. I, I wasn't a Beatles fan. I have to tell that honestly to my Beatle friends because, you know, I'm not going to fake it. I, I mean, I'm a boomer. I faked things, but not a Beatle. I, I, I had, get you. I, I had Bobby Rydell on. I was a, you know, I, I like the ones that came before the mm -hmm. Beatles. And I like Bobby Rydell, Paul, and you know what I'm talking about, them. Yeah. Everyone says, what's your next book? I don't know. The monkeys in Akron. I have no idea. You know, I mean, <laughs> Rolling Stones. I like, I like all that kind of stuff, but uh, yeah, but that, those are the two books. Cause they were just very interesting when I started researching those. I thought, well, that's, those are books. So. Well, thank you so much. And now that you're a graduate of comic spot, anytime you want to plug anything here, you just let me know. I'll put you on so you can plug anything. Well, I will say our podcast is coming back for a third season okay. in September. It's called What's So Funny. Okay. And I'm the host. But I have three rotating guest hosts that come on with me. Okay. okay. Kelly, Tom, and Logan. And uh, we change the format every once in a while, but we, we take a classic comedian, classic, maybe comedy album, whatever, and um, we discuss it we talk about it. So we are already taping the third season. This is done by the Front Porch people, a big production company. They do a lot of, they have a lot of shows. I'm just a, I'm just the host. But uh, so far for our, our season starting out in September, we've talked George Carlin, Freddie Prinz, and this week we're doing Red Fox. What? That's and, crazy. And trust me, this is a family show. And we're talking about, I talked to my producer this morning, I said, what are we going to talk about about with Red Fox? Have you listened to his stuff? <laughs> but we're but we talk about their impact on comedy, who they influenced. You know, Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, all these guys, Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, um, their careers, all that kind of stuff. And and uh, yeah, we 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 I, I won't get into all the list of all the comics, but you know, Steve Martin and and uh, you know, Lily Tomlin, all we, we, we cover them all. We try to get to all of them and just how important they were and what an influence they were in the comedy business. So, so I called, went and I subscribed so to your YouTube. That's Dave Schwenson. Yes. But to, I need to subscribe to your podcast as well. What's so funny? What's so, yeah. If you go, now see, I don't have that information in front of me. I wish I did. If you go on Facebook and you go to the front porch people. Okay. You'll see they have a lot of shows. Okay. And what's so funny is one of them. Uh, okay. I think if you if you can Google what's so funny, if you can remember how to spell my name, it might come up. And, <laughs> think it might and the thing is, you can That's listen. That's a callback, you guys. Yeah. You can <laughs> for our, our last season we just did, and we had a good season this last one too. We had Lenny Bruce and Dick Gregory and Mort Saul, and and uh, yeah. I can't remember all that we talked about. We did about 12, 15 shows. So it's all about classic comedy. Where this stuff. Hey, nobody's inventing the wheel with comedy. It's all influence that comes from someplace else. Same thing like when I talk about music, all right? Trace it all the way back to, you know, Robert Johnson and the blues and everything up to through Michael Jackson and everything else. It's all traceable. Same yes. thing with comedy. Same thing with comedy. We have to know our history in yes. comedy. So many get up there, you know, like there's so much respect that is due to those who came before us. Yes. Oh, and some of that hassle. I mean, we did a show on Lenny Bruce. I mean, he just got abused. I mean, just, but if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have had, you know, George Carlin or Richard Pryor the way you had them, you know, the way we had them. And, you know, it goes on from there. So, yeah. But even Mort Saul, the first stand up comedy album, we played it. Here it is. And we discussed every track. So, yeah. Super duper. Thank you so <laughs> much, Dave Schwenson with an E. <laughs> okay. I think I okay. talked too much. Linda, thank you no, so much for having me. I enjoyed I, it. You didn't talk too much. You can okay. come back anytime and talk more. Thank you so much. Thank Dave you. Schwenson. Take care. Love bye. you. Bye. Bye.